In 2008, a slice of life anime called Kaneki came out. Two years later, a man who worked on it was found dead. And for a while, this incident was a mystery. The big question being whether he did it himself or whether it was staged. It would take the government four years to finish their investigation. That after he'd worked 600 hours with no paid overtime and a week where he couldn't even go home, the man had ended his life. Working for one of the most famous anime studios in Japan, which got off completely scot-free. If you want to know what's even worse, how much comforts do you think this got, given how popular anime is? The lines are like five hours. Earthquake, we're all fucking I mean, I assume a lot. Mm -hmm. It was like it never happened. And in my quest to find out the answer to one simple question, I unearthed the dark truth that anime would rather you not know. That behind the cute girls running around on your screen is a war that has been raging since before World War II. Entangling in it some of the most famous Japanese people in history, from the seats of power in the Japanese government all the way across the ocean to the doorsteps of Walt Disney. A war that has consumed countless numbers of innocent lives and dreams as people fight to just be treated like human beings. Hijacked by companies exploiting the fallout of anime's god, dooming it all to slowly fall apart at the sea. But the worst part is, you've been staring at the truth for years. It's just been one click away. In January 2019, a new horror anime was released, featuring a group of orphans being raised to slaughter. The Promised Neverland quickly became the most popular of the season. Every man, woman, and child was talking about it. The story, the characters, the atmosphere, everything was phenomenal. So when The Promised Neverland Season 2 was announced in early 2021, anime fans expected nothing less than an epic sequel to the story that shook the winter of 2019. But that's not what they got. I just finished watching Episode 6 of Promised Neverland Season 2, and it is the most abominable, putrid pile of dog shit I've the ever seen. The second season of The Promised Neverland was bad. Like, like, really bad. And what happened to that second season quickly became one of the biggest mysteries of 2021. How did such a popular series suddenly turn into such a dumpster fire? Was the animation studio just inept? Was it higher up corporate pressure? Was the manga artist pulling the strings? Nobody knew, and virtually nothing was said about it. Overshadowed by the other two series, Studio Cloverworks made in 2021, The Promised Neverland Season 2 was seemingly thrown out the window as if the entire series was a failure. As if the first season wasn't a mega popular success. As if the studio was in debt or something. As fans were finishing up Demon Slayer and Attack on Titan Season 3, Cloverworks would reveal something odd. After having produced not only The Promised Neverland, but also Darling the Franks and Bunny Girl Senpai in the same fiscal year, the studio had made no profit. In fact, they were 7 million yen in the hole. And they were lucky, because as the anime industry reported that it grew to a market cap of 2 trillion yen, industry surveys reported that the back end of the anime industry was actually in a crisis. 40% of all studios in debt, the industry shrinking by 5%, anime numbers collapsing for four years straight and what seemed like an endless stream of employee horror stories. It was so bad that some reports even predicted the industry's imminent collapse. Something that anime had actually done to itself. In the 1960s, the manga anime industry got into a civil war. Specifically, this man, godfather of manga Osamu Tezuka, thought Japan's biggest animation studio was a load of shit. And Toei thought Tezuka was a massive bitch. Feeling like he had no control over his story and the production process, Tezuka decided to build his own anime studio from the fortune he made and take the direction of anime into his own hands, eventually arriving at his crown jewel, an anime adaptation of his manga masterpiece, Astro Boy. Now with an anime on his hands, all you had to do was bid for a slot in the air, which I'm to Tezuka meant that he had to outbid the one and only Disney. 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 Did you check with the government and see if they needed any money lately? <laughs> Faced with the challenge of having to financially outbid Disney in order to air his anime to the public, Tezuka realized something important. He might not have been as rich as Disney, but he had bigger balls. <laughs> yeah. And so he decided to take the age-old financial yeah, advice of, uh, if you can't buy it, then go into debt for it. A lot of debt for it. Oh, don't worry about how you're gonna pay it. Luckily, since Astro Boy was already popular in Japan and Tezuka decided to push for the unheard of rate of an episode a week, Tezuka managed to turn his smart financial decision into billions of dollars of profit through the power of marketing and merchandise. Faced with that amount of money, other animation studios quickly conformed to this weekly schedule, using Tezuka's refined techniques to kind of cheat the animation process and make it easier to upload every week, and sending Tezuka to the god of anime, as well as manga. It's a spicy title. There's only one problem though. Astro Boy looks like this. That night, at the Institute of Science... Modern anime looks father. like this. 
That weekly upload schedule has not changed. In addition, not every animation studio could just go into hilarious amounts of debt. And while TV stations and the government could initially make up that shortfall, by the time Neon Genesis Evangelion rolled around, anime was just getting way too expensive. And with Japan's economic miracle about to explode in the country's face, the decision was made to implement a relatively unknown funding strategy that had in it a slow, creeping death. That explains how animators can barely afford food while their creations go on to rake in billions of dollars of profit, and being nearly impossible to escape from. But the worst part is, you already know what it is. Heon is a slice of life anime involving a group of high school girls who make a band called the Sakuroko Keonbu. It's a pretty cute show, but when I watched it for the first time, I found something really off. Besides the fact that Mio overrated, Ritsu best girl, in the opening of every episode, an inexplicable blurb of text would appear on screen without fail that made me question my sanity. Here, see if you can spot it. There. The show about the fictional Sakura Kokeonbu was produced by the Sakura Kokeonbu. And once I saw that, it was like the floodgates had opened. Nier Automata, Land of the Lustrous, Anohana, even The Promised Neverland. Nearly every single anime had this weird little text at the end, and then some just didn't include it. And with how anime credits are structured, the most important people came at the end. So what was more important than the animation studio, the anime director, and even the original author? Remember when I brought up Astro Boy and Chainsaw Man? Well, let me ask you something. What's the actual difference between these two anyways? More colors? More detail? More good stuff? I mean, okay, this picture probably took longer to draw, but aren't animation studios made up of artists? Just throw a few on there and it would take like an hour, right? It can't be that hard. Oh my god. That's where the problem is. Not only is there like a million frames in a single anime episode, there's 2D art, 3D art, special effects, voice uh actors, Music, people who plan, stage, direct, script, write, edit, manage the whole operation. Whether it's so employees know what's going on or keeping character models consistent so a character doesn't suddenly become a different race the next time you see them, the anime production process is ginormous. So with all these people running around and busting their asses to make your favorite anime, let me ask you a question. Who's gonna pay all? 7% here, loss of 37 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered. Making anime is like entering the stock market. Freaked out, waiting to see how low Burrito. will go. When you buy a company's stock, you're technically buying an ownership in the company, which means that you technically have power over what the company does. But come on, what are you going to do with your 0.1 shares of Apple? And we all know due diligence is a myth. Anyway. Now, okay, forget about all that bullshit. What's the real reason you invest in the stock market? Money. And that, my friends, is what Neon Genesis Evangelion did to anime. It turned the entire thing into the stock market. Which means that, yeah, a few girls and a guy with mental health issues have made it so that you could own a portion of your favorite anime and even make money off of it if it does well. Isn't that great? I lied. You can't. Because the only people allowed to enter the anime market are people who can pull a Tezuka and spin an anime into a billion dollars of profit. Which nowadays means you have to be a corporation. And with each anime being infinitely more complicated than the last, and production values skyrocketing with little to stop them, more and more bigger and bigger corporations are being called on to invest in the anime that you want. Which means all these companies are fighting over how they want the anime to go. Making the entire process an expensive, bureaucratic nightmare. Wait, 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 wait hold up a second. If production values are going up, then why are 40% of all anime studios in debt? Shouldn't the production committee raise enough money to cover the wages and the production? Well, let me introduce you to one man. Just this once. PewDiePie. You remember that time Felix was waging a sub battle against T-Series? Well, number wise, he lost. Spoiler alert. But does anyone actually care? It wasn't like after the dust settled, everyone thought he was a massive loser and unsubscribed. This, incidentally, is how Japanese companies work. Replace a few labels on the graph and suddenly you have Japanese intercorporate culture or something like that. Since production committees are made up of companies coming from various industries, if two companies come from the same industry, say, body pillows, there will inevitably be one company that outsells the other, aka a winner and a loser. Actually, it should be the other way around. And Japanese companies really don't like being the loser. So much to the point that there will only be one company per industry on the production committee, severely limiting the amount of money that can go into anime production, because companies have budgets. And okay, you know what, let's just get someone in the industry to explain it instead. Okay, Japanese companies suck, but what about foreign ones? Surely some big international company has looked at this and realized it might make them some money, right? Well, no, not really, because anime is a stock, and in stocks, money is control. So to prevent some random ass company from essentially buying out their anime, the production committee will take that foreign investment meant for one anime and instead of put it into a hundred, screwing literally every party over just to maintain their majority control. And what can the people who draw the anime do about this? 
nothing. Because most of the time, they're not even on the committee. And even if they are, they don't have enough ownership to force the committee to raise more money. So they're put into a very pleasant position of having to make anime with pretty much no money. And they do make an anime because they signed a contract that says they have to. And once that anemically funded anime goes out, the production committee turns around and says, oh wow, you made this anime with no money? Clearly you're capable, so why don't we do it again? This is what the Sakura Kokeonbu actually is. The production committee. Who doesn't value anime for your petty little reasons like laughs, tears, or childhood memories, <laughs> but as a means to one single end, to make as much money as possible. But hold on a minute, let's not jump to conclusions here. Production committees are kind of scummy, but it's not like they're all evil mustache trolling villains. And unfortunately, the service they provide is kind of necessary. I mean, how many studios can you think of that can cough up the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars that it costs to just produce one episode of anime, let alone the millions it takes to produce an entire season? And don't forget, these anime that you watch, they're all a product of survivorship bias. These actually survived the process. Imagine the 90% of anime that get all this funding just to never be released, which would put studios into multiple millions of dollars of debt. These anime studios need money to survive, and the production committee does that for them, even if it's really shitty. They raise the money and allocate it to revenue stream. The anime, the merch, the t-shirts, the body pillows. It's just ironic that out of all of these streams of income, the least profitable part of it is the anime itself. Hello everybody, my name is- How do you think YouTubers make money? Discounting all the merch, sponsorships, and all the other stuff. The main way any YouTuber makes money off YouTube itself is ads. <laughs> Sorry about that. Advertisers want to make a lot of money by selling a lot of stuff to a lot of people, which means they'll pay more for ads to either reach a lot of people, or the really rich people, or both. Which is anime's issue. Because the time anime is aired on TV in Japan is not really conducive to advertisers. With the waking hours being taken up by shows that are aimed at an audience that usually doesn't have any money, and the shows that are actually aimed at people who have money are aired at a time when most of them are asleep. Which means advertisers won't pay that much unless it's an uber popular anime like Demon Slayer. So if anime doesn't make that much money, then what does? So I'm waiting in line to get the figures. I've gone to get the figures. This man in front of me literally just spent about six grand, Ten grand. on Ten thousand dollars. 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 Just like how Tezuka put his bets on the power of otaku, so do modern production committees, who invest the majority of their money not into making the anime, but getting the word out about the anime and making all the merch that anime fans gobble up. Which, through a strange turn of events, has resulted in this. Do you notice something wrong? Why is this DVD so expensive? The price of anime DVDs have always looked kind of ridiculous to me. You want me to pay almost $50 for a part of a season of an anime that I can just watch online for free? I mean, through verified online streaming sites? And beyond that, people don't buy DVDs anymore. Right? And sweet, because I have a lot. I have a few hundred- Well, as it turns out, people still do. And in fact, anime DVDs are like this MacBook Pro stand. A luxury item. Overpriced because the profit made from the people buying is enough to outweigh all the lost profit from the people who don't. In fact, in the good old days, anime DVDs used to make so much profit that it's propped up entire studios before. Spoiler alert, those good old days are over. Because nowadays, most anime is watched through streaming services like Crunchyroll and Netflix, who the committee requires pay a few thousand dollars minimum per anime episode in an attempt to recoup production costs. An attempt that's usually completely hopeless. Because did I mention that anime is getting so expensive that entire production committees are going into debt? Which lends itself to the unfortunate realization that, yeah, your life is probably worth less than Oreimo or El Manga Sensei is worth to the production committee. Because just like the money raised for anime came through them first, the money profited from anime goes through the committee first as well because they are the ones that technically own the anime because anime is a stock and only the owners of that stock get to reap the profit of it besides the creators involved in the project already got paid up front not our problem if they went over budget which means even if an anime is a big hit sometimes the anime studio doesn't get a single penny knowing all this would explain why even though the anime production industry has been collapsing inwards for a few years anime and the anime distribution industry have reached all-time highs because they're either paid on their own terms or through being on the production committee not starved of money and also getting the profits last, which makes anime studios mass outsourcing work to lower wage countries like China or the Philippines seem a lot more reasonable. Well, it would be more reasonable if it made everyone's life easier. But it doesn't. Because now with workers spread out all over the world, it becomes increasingly more difficult to coordinate this ginormous border transcending system to match the week on week deadlines that someone decided the anime industry should move at. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, give a studio all the money they want, but it's never gonna matter if the anime just never comes out.
The final season of Attack on Titan is kind of a joke. Delays on top of delays have turned the finale of Isayama's story into perhaps the only real life example of an infinite fractal. And for a series where the final season was handed off from the incumbent Wit Studios to Mappa solely because Wit was having some behind the scenes chaos, it's just how? No, like I'm serious, how? How do anime studios who outsource work in these massive amounts have these kinds of production issues? Especially when the employees are working so many hours that it's being compared to literal slavery. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were a freelance animator working on some no-name anime, would you keep working at these amazing wage rates? What about like twice over? Thrice over? How about 10 times over? No, I'm being completely serious. Because not only is VA and sound work done before the animation is completed, meaning studios have to rush out a rough draft for the VAs before then going back at them remaking everything for real for real, if you look closer at the production system chart that was somehow legibly translated from a 240p picture, you'll realize that the vast majority of the blocks here are literally just checking if things are done right and then redoing them over and over again. Which, even though it works, pisses off literally everyone involved in making an anime. Whether it's the higher-ups, the entry-level workers, the production committee, or even the audience, forced to watch as the system hemorrhages time away as it's stuck looping the same track over and over and over again, creating an uncontrollable crisis that forces more and more employees to work longer and longer hours to make up for all the time wasted away, until inevitably someone, somewhere, reaches their breaking point. In 2019, a Madhouse employee sued the company after working nearly 400 hours of unpaid overtime in one month, doing the very important job of coordinating this ginormous mess. After having to drive around all night and day in a company car delivering materials to studio employees, the consequences of this broken system finally caused him to collapse on the street as he returned home at 7 a.m. But come on, is it really that surprising? I mean, the most obvious consequence of having such a huge production system is that there are so many points of failure. One delay anywhere. Whether it's because the director overslept, the animator got an injury, or some outsourced person is late on delivery, one delay cascades down the entire system, causing everything behind it to get even further behind. The worst part is, the anime industry kind of brought this one on themselves too. With nearly every studio being in Tokyo and pay rates being not so great, many employees are forced to work on multiple jobs, in multiple projects, sometimes in multiple companies. <laughs> This set of circumstances means that every single time an anime upload deadline rolls around that there's an ungodly crunch hour where employees are trying to make up for so much lost time that they can't eat or sleep or even go home. Because it's not like episodes are worked on one by one, they're worked on in batches of three or four. Which means if a delay happens, it's not just merely one episode off schedule, it's a third of the season. With all this pressure and chaos coming down on employees who are most of the time just blameless victims, some people will stay up nights to make those deadlines, while others, understandably, are done with this bullshit and decide to just disappear in the middle of the production process, making everything worse. And almost all of them will wish that this system was different. <laughs> that they, the government, or something will come in and fix this abomination of a system that exploits their passions and dreams to basically voluntarily enslave them. But at the end of the day, all of that is merely just a pipe dream. Because the struggle to make anime a good place to work has been fought for decades upon decades by some of the most venerable names in Japanese history. And near nothing has changed. Because while our story may have started with The Promised Neverland, the true story stretches far into the past. Almost a hundred years back to modern anime's birth, when one war ended and another began. When America occupied Japan at the end of the Second World War, they restructured everything about the country. And that included a concept that most Japanese had never heard of before. Collective bargaining. And I mean, it's not too hard to see why labor unions were kind of foreign to the Japanese. In a country where harmony and the respect to hierarchy was the norm for like, a lot of years, a ragtag group of subordinate employees getting together and demanding something from their boss was something people just would not do. Inevitably though, the concept began to see adoption, and in 1961, anime's first labor union was formed, the Toei Animation Labor Union. Remember Toei? And to be fair to the union, they actually did quite a lot. Founded by people involved in the production of Lupine the Third, and eventually coming to involve a very impassioned chief secretary by the name of Hayao Miyazaki, the union fought tooth and nail, winning concession after concession after concession, but they were on borrowed time. Toei had already started hiring out domestic freelancers in place of a permanent employees, making unionization more difficult. Two years later, Tezuka propped up this weekly upload norm, and then anime started to get really expensive, to the point where, by the time the 70s rolled around, Toei, along with some other anime studios, were hundreds of millions of yen in debt, and Toei decided to conveniently solve the problem by just nuking half of its workforce. As you'd expect, 
People were pissed. And while the union would fight a two-year court battle that would recapture 18 of 170 layoffs, 150 of those people, whether laid off or not, permanently left, including two friends who went on to establish a studio called Ghibli. After this, the situation only got worse. With anime expenses getting higher and higher, a studio called Sunrise would pioneer the concept of international outsourcing when it produced Mobile Suit Gundam. And as more and more of the industry turned into independent contractors now scattered all across the world, union organization became more and more untenable. And as production committees and the horrible working conditions of the modern anime industry began to solidify, the first generation of animators decided to try one more time to save what they loved so dearly, aimed at appealing the one actor that had more power than the companies did, the government. And to be clear, J. Anika, a union founded by old people like Toyo Ashida and Satoshi Kon, was initially just aiming for guaranteeing retirement benefits, nothing more. But as the years rolled on and the working conditions of the anime industry were leaked to the Japanese public, the union gathered more and more members that weren't as old, and eventually became the spearhead of the anime unionization effort, winning a number of things it set out to do, including getting the support of the government of Japan. Unfortunately, that government didn't stay in power for long, and Janika's proposals were cancelled being cited as a waste of taxpayers' money. And while Janica would continue its efforts valiantly, it had reached its peak. Infighting in an unsupportive government doomed any future efforts. The union's last stand would come with a project that translates to anime's future. Anime no mirai wo kaero. Proposed to the Department of Cultural Affairs, the entire project's premise was that if you paid people more, more people would want to come and work. Come on, guys. Really? But for one reason or another, Anime Mirai didn't prove to be successful enough to continue. And the entire program was given to the Japanese Animation Association, a group of 38 of the biggest animation companies in Japan, who coincidentally decided to switch the premise of the program. The anime industry now reaching 90 years old, and Janika's original founder now dead, most of the old guard took their leave. With nothing to show but blood and defeat in a war that lasted nearly a century. The men and women that had built and fought for anime their love, their life, their legacy. Finally gave up. Amen. え、なん。本当に素晴らしいのかどうかわからないよね。<笑><笑> きちんと考えたら映画が好きだったのは多分そういう趣味でしょうっていう金を稼ぎたいとかそういうのは全部論外有名になりたいっても論外そんなクソくらいでそういうことじゃない急所さ頼める何け勝ってそういう映画が作られ
for a few more years and avoided this entire shit show, and history would forever know the name of the Toei Animation Labor Union. Oh. Shit. If you take a look at all the anime released nowadays and trace them back to what studio made them, you'll realize that, well, there's not a lot of Toei here? So what exactly would the Toei Union do for anyone who works outside of Toei? Yeah. Nothing. Which is exactly why, even though on paper they accomplished a lot, in reality the Toei Union didn't really do much at all. Because they worked to better the conditions at Toei, not anime. And well, aside from Janica, there was never an anime union. And given that everyone's outsourcing everyone now, it's kind of not possible to make one. Which makes anime the only instance I know of where the companies are better at organizing themselves than the workers. But at the end of the day, unions, politics, power, it all precipitates the actual problem. Money. God, this show is fucking weird. Because regardless of how many other things people want to try and solve first, from how inefficient making anime is to the looming aging crisis it will soon face, it all stems from the fact that no matter which way you put it, no one's gonna work 7 day 100 hour work weeks for months on end getting paid anywhere from less than $3 an hour to $5 a fucking day. Because it's just not right. And if you speak in business better than morals, it's not operationally sustainable. And unless people are content with letting Japanese anime, with all of its history, it's people, its products and its influences burn straight into the ground and become another part of history where we wonder what could have been, nothing's going to change. Which means that, well, the fate of anime is really up to the people that watch it. Us. To decide whether or not we're okay with the way history is going. Not knowing that behind every opening we skip, every filler episode we see, and every cancelled season we lament, the people who made what changed so many of our lives continue to fight to share their dreams with us, to share their stories with us, to share their anime with us. And I think it's about time we give something back. This is the first time I fucking use this thing for anything outside. Okay, I mean I messed up the final one so it's fine. Still got some time. It's cold. Let's go! Honestly, everything is so fucked up. There's so many problems with anime that I honestly just feel it'd be best if it went and died. Gemba Bimbo, なのかっていうのがもうね、今日聞いたらこれ一回でバッチリわかるっていう説明でございます。経済対策として今の不景気というものに対応する。あもしもし。あもしもし。こんばんは。こんばんは。宇宙人。それで宇宙人から書いたあのセリロの上下を着て、そして裸足の足に美人さんだろう。高畑いたを伊佐を子とパクさんに出会った瞬間だった。その初めて言葉を交わした日のことは今でもよく覚えています。黄昏の時のバス停で僕は練馬駅のバスを待っていた。雨上がりの水たまりの残る通りを一人の